Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude, and I'm here to tell you about an awesome way for you to rub elbows with your favorite podcast host here on the Sports History Network, while at the same time rooting for your hometown team this upcoming NFL season. You've been hearing all about our partner, Tailgate Fantasy, the past few weeks. Well, dig on this. Tailgate created a special Sports History Network League for our listeners, so we can put the word fan back into fantasy football together. It's free to join, and if you do so before the season kicks off, you'll automatically be entered into a drawing for a free t-shirt from one of our other partners, Home Field Apparel. It's a win-win-win! So hurry up today and head to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash tailgate for all the details. Again, at sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash tailgate. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to award-winning Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza, and this is a podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. We are bringing old-school basketball to a new-school audience. And today we bring you the story of Oscar Robertson. Now, this is a story that I have been wanting to do for quite a while, but at times it felt that the story was just too big. Oscar Robertson is one of the most significant players in basketball history, so I wanted to make sure that I did the story justice. For those that watch the NBA way back in the 1960s, Oscar was the best all-around basketball player that they had ever seen. And this is what people mean when they say the best all-around player. Now, Oscar did not rebound like Bill Russell, and he did not score like Will Chamberlain. But what Oscar was good at was everything. Until eight years ago, he was the only player in NBA history to average a triple-double for an entire season. He could shoot, he could rebound, he could dish out assists, he could defend, and he was the floor general for his team running the offense. He could do everything at a very high level. He had no weaknesses. Now that is what they mean when they say that he was the best all-around player. He had no weaknesses in his game. At 6'5", he was a big guard for his day. Typically, a player of his size would have been a small forward or even a power forward. But he had incredible guard skills and the analytical mind necessary to be a point guard and run the team. He had a knack for breaking down a defense and exploiting the weaknesses of an opposing team. And just to be clear about where Oscar stands in the pantheon of the great players, before Michael Jordan joined the NBA, many considered Oscar Robertson to be the greatest player of all time. Oscar was born on November 24, 1938 in Charlotte, Tennessee. He was raised in a rural area on land originally owned by his great-grandfather, Marshall Collier. Now, his great-grandfather, Marshall, had been a slave prior to emancipation. But once he was free, he was able to secure some land and farmed it to support his family. And according to records, great-grandfather Marshall was 7 foot 2, and he lived to be 116 years old, the oldest person in America at the time that he died. Young Oscar knew his great-grandfather Marshall. They had a relationship as most of the family lived on or near Marshall's land. Oscar was the youngest of three brothers born to Bailey Robertson Sr. and Mazelle Robertson. His older brother was Bailey Jr., also known as Flap, and then Henry. Oscar's family moved to Indianapolis when Oscar was just around 40 years old, but Oscar and his brothers returned to Tennessee every summer to work on the farm, and they did that for many years. The Robertson family settled in a low-income neighborhood in Indianapolis. Money was very tight in his family, even with both of his parents working. According to Oscar, they only had meat for dinner once or twice a week because that was all they could afford. They mostly ate various vegetable dishes and bread. However, one thing that their neighborhood had would change the course of Oscar's life. There was an outdoor basketball court in the neighborhood and Oscar could go out there and play every chance he got. The court was nicknamed the Dust Bowl because it was often covered in dust and dirt from nearby construction work. And Oscar loved it out there. And so did his two older brothers. As a youngster, Oscar would have trouble getting into the pickup games because he was so young. Over time, his skills improved and he found himself getting more and more court time in those pickup games. One of the beauties of basketball is that it is a very inexpensive sport to get into. You only need one ball and up to to 10 people can play. No special equipment is necessary like pads or helmets or sticks or anything else. Just a ball and a court. And courts were getting popular around the country because they were relatively inexpensive to build and cheap to maintain. 
That is why parks and recreation departments around the world have basketball courts. It is a very cost-effective way to provide recreation for a community. Basketball courts are far cheaper to build and maintain than football or baseball fields, and they take up far less space. A local parks and recreation department can build four basketball courts for less money, and they also take up less space than building one baseball field. That is what made it so easy for Oscar and his brothers to get a lot of time on the court at the Dust Bowl. But one Christmas, Oscar received a gift that would change everything for him. Oscar's mother was a housekeeper for a wealthy family in Indianapolis, but one day she noticed that the son of the wealthy family threw out an old basketball because it was worn and threadbare. She fished the basketball out of the trash and took it home. She saved that extremely worn basketball to give it to Oscar as his Christmas gift for that year. Young Oscar did not care that the ball was used. It was a real basketball and something that he did not have previously. He was now able to work on his skills on his own and that really changed things for a young Oscar. Very quickly, he was able to improve his dribbling and shooting skills. He put in hours and hours on that court with the ball just trying to get better. His improvement showed as he was finding himself getting picked for teams in the local pickup games. It seems that other players were looking forward to playing with Oscar. Now even though his skills were improving, the real star of the Robertson family at the time was Bailey Jr., the oldest of the Robertson boys. Bailey Jr., again, went by the nickname Flap and Flap was playing for Crispus Attucks High School, the only black high school in all of Indianapolis, which was still segregating their students. So all of the black students in Indianapolis went to Crispus Attucks. In 1951, when Flap was still a sophomore and still coming off the bench for Attucks, he went all the way to the round of eight in the Indiana State Basketball Championship. It was the first time that Oscar got to see a TV and it was to watch his own brother. At the time of the game, the ball went to Flap for the game winner and he hit it to move Attucks past Anderson High School and into the Final Four of the Indiana High School State Championship. It was an exciting time for the Robertson family. Flap was a really good player, and he was a showman on the court, which is something that Oscar lacked. Oscar's game was all about efficiency and getting the job done. If he made a great play, he would just run back on defense and did not make a big deal about it. But Flap loved the attention, and playing to the crowd is something that he loved to do. Eventually, it was time for Oscar to attend and to join the basketball team at Christmas was Attucks High School. Now this is a good place to take a break and I'll be right back with more of Oscar Robertson's high school career. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One Gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row 1 catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row 1 Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes. Hi, everybody. Dan and Andrew from Hello Old Sports here. We wanted to drop in and let you know about our latest episode. That's right. We interviewed the co-authors of Phyllis George, Shattering the Ceiling, a biography of groundbreaking broadcaster Phyllis George. And her life is really sort of a journey through 20th century America, from Miss America pageants to the Kentucky State House to the groundbreaking NFL Today show on CBS, even the Kentucky Colonels, the old ABA. We got into all sorts of stories about the Celtics under Red Auerbach, about the interview with Roger Staubach, about really all sorts of things, a fight between Brent Musburger and Jimmy the Greek. We really enjoyed talking with Lenny Shulman and Paul Volponi, who teamed up to write this book. The book is on sale right now wherever books are sold, you know, within reason, garage sales, probably not. So <laughs> go ahead and pick up a copy today. And if you want a chance to win the book, you can go to sportshistorynetwork.com slash giveaways and register for a chance to win. Goodbye, old sports. 
Welcome back to the show and let us continue with the story of Oscar Robertson. Before the break, we share the story of his upbringing leading him to attending Christmas Attics High School in Indianapolis. As a freshman, Oscar was only 5'8 and he played on the junior varsity or JV team. And he played quite well and received good teaching. The thing with Oscar was that his game was so fundamentally sound. He was never flashy, he was all about winning. Even his coaches noticed that it seemed that Oscar was always two steps ahead of the other team. He would make a pass at the perfect time or put himself in the most advantageous position to shoot the ball. He was just playing at a different level than everyone else his age. By sophomore year, he had made the varsity mostly because he had grown to six foot three, which already made him one of the tallest players on the team and easily the most talented. For that reason, the coach played Oscar at power forward. Now, due to his size, it seemed like the most natural position, but what could not be denied was that Oscar had incredible guard skills for someone of his size. The team was playing well, but his coach soon realized that by moving Oscar to his natural position of point guard, it could supercharge the team. And that's exactly what happened. With the ball in Oscar's hands and with Oscar running the offense, everything just fell into place and the team turned into a juggernaut. Oscar was the breakout star leading the team in scoring, rebounding, and assists. He also guarded the other team's best player. He was the engine that made everything go. But I do not want to give the impression that Addicts was a one-man show. Oscar did have some very talented teammates, but he was definitely the breakout star as a sophomore. He proved himself to be one of the best players in the entire state of Indiana, and he still had two more years of high school left to play. That 1954 season was so successful that Oscar led the team all the way to the Indiana State semifinals. Attics was one of the four best teams in the entire state. Now at that semifinal, Attics was matched up with Milan High School. And I want to stop here for a moment to get into this particular game. In Indiana, in the state semifinals and the championship game were always held on the same day. The two semifinal games were played earlier in the day, and then there was a break, and that the two winners would play for the state championship that night. But in 1954, we had Milan High School from the very small town of Milan, Indiana. Now, this is a team that inspired the movie Hoosiers, and I did an entire episode on this very Milan team. It was episode 45, if you want to go and check that out. I not only tell the famous story of this little team that could, but also compared some of the plays from the real game with the movie version of the game. Now, in addition to that, there were twin boys sitting in the stands with their father. The father was a high school basketball coach and he took his boys to the state championship every year as spectators. His two boys were very talented players themselves and it was the father's hope that his two boys would grow up to play for him and take his team to the Indiana State Championship. Those boys were the Van Arsdale twins, Dick and Tom. And I covered their story in episodes 111 and 112. In those episodes, I mentioned how they attended the Indiana State Championship and were completely enamored with the play of Oscar Robertson. The boys thought that Oscar was the greatest player they had ever seen. Tom grew up to be teammates with Oscar on the Cincinnati Royals. So this is the third time that I am covering this one game. As we know, Milan was the team of destiny that year. They defeated Christmas Addicts and then won the Indiana State Championship later that night. For Oscar Robertson and the rest of his teammates, things were looking up. They were a great team and they made it all the way to the Indiana Final Four and Oscar would still get two more shots at winning the state championship. Now, as a side note, the summer between Oscar's sophomore and junior year, his older brother Flap had graduated college and signed a contract with the Harlem Globetrotters. This allowed Oscar to meet and play with guys like Marquez Haynes and Goose Tatum, and it was great for Oscar to get some experience with professional players. And back in the mid-1950s, many of the Globetrotters were as good or better than the players in the NBA. It's just that black players couldn't play in the NBA quite yet. So for his junior year, Oscar had grown to his full height of 6'5 and was an even better player than the year before. Now that year, Christmas Addicts High School steamrolled their way all through the schedule and made it to the Indiana State Championship game. For the first time in Indiana history, two all-black high schools were playing for the championship. 
In the end, Christmas Addicts defeated Roosevelt High 97-74. It was an incredibly high-scoring game. The year before, the Milan High School team, they won the championship 32-30. Oscar scored 30 points by himself in that championship game. Now, traditionally, the city of Indianapolis put the winning team on a fire engine and drove them around the city so that everyone could take a look at the new champions. However, when Addicts won it all, they still got to ride on a fire engine, but instead of riding through downtown Indianapolis, as was tradition, the engine took a turn and the engine went through the neighborhood where Addicts was located. Oscar was quite offended by this. He thought that the team should be driven through downtown Indianapolis just like every other team before them. But Oscar was on top of the world as the best player on the best team in the entire state of Indiana. He still had one more year to go, and as a state champion, Oscar was able to go to a restaurant for the very first time in his life. Yes, that is correct. Oscar Robertson's family still struggled financially and he had never been to a restaurant before the age of 16. His team was being honored as the state champion and they were being taken to a very nice restaurant in downtown Indianapolis to be recognized. He was nervous and made sure that he learned about the etiquette of dining in a nice place. For his senior year, the team was even better. They went through the schedule pretty much unchallenged and they made it back to the championship game with a perfect record. They had just one more game to complete, the first undefeated season in the history of Indiana high school basketball. They played Lafayette High School and defeated them 79-57. to The 22-point victory showed just how powerful they were. Oscar was named that season's Mr. Basketball as the best senior in the state. Again, the team was put on a fire engine and driven through their own neighborhood instead of going through a downtown Indianapolis. But his high school career was not over yet. He still had two more games to play. Every year, the state of Indiana puts together an all-star team made up of the 10 best seniors in the state, and they play two games against the all-star team from the state of Kentucky, and all of the money would go to charity. And they played the first game in Indianapolis and the second game up in Lexington. Now, as Mr. Basketball for Indiana, Oscar got to wear jersey number one for the Indiana All-Stars. The kid that was named Mr. Basketball for Kentucky was a kid named Kelly Coleman, better known as King Kelly Coleman. As the best player in Kentucky, he was looking forward to his matchup with Oscar and even said so to the press. He predicted that he would dominate Indiana and especially Oscar Robertson. Oscar did not know what to make of some kid in Kentucky talking bad about him and the two players had never even met each other before. In the first game, Indiana won 92-78. Oscar scored 34 points while Coleman scored 17, and Coleman claimed after the game that he was under the weather and not feeling all that well. A week later, in the second game, Indiana won again, but this time by an even greater margin of 102 to 77. Oscar scored 41 points, and King Coleman, he only had four. The consensus was that Oscar Robertson was not only the best player in Indiana, but possibly the best player in the entire country. Everybody wanted to land the talents of Oscar Robertson. He had 75 schools contacting him. Many of these schools tried working on Oscar's father only to realize that he had virtually no influence on where Oscar would go and play his college ball. Oscar's mother had a little bit more say, but not enough to really influence Oscar's decision. Oscar was going to go where he thought he had the best fit. For most players from Indiana, their dream school is Indiana University, but the coach at Indiana did not seem that excited about landing Oscar. It seemed that he just assumed that Oscar would want to go there and did not really recruit him that hard. And Oscar felt the same way and decided that maybe Indiana was not the place for him. The University of Michigan also wanted Oscar and they flew him up for a visit and it was the first time that Oscar had ever been on an airplane. He asked the flight attendant how much the drinks cost only to find out that sodas were free. When he landed in Michigan, there was nobody there at the airport to meet him, and he figured that somebody from the university would come by to pick him up and give him a ride to the campus. So he called the coach from the airport, and they said that they had forgotten that that was the day he was arriving. Now, can you imagine that? We are talking about Oscar Robertson, and a college coach forgot the day that Oscar was visiting. So Robertson did not even bother going to the campus. He immediately took the next flight back to Indianapolis and was home the same day. In the end, he ended up choosing the University of Cincinnati, which was just a couple of hours from Indianapolis so his friends and family could easily go see him play. It was a smaller school back then as it was still a private school. It has since gone public and has grown to 30,000 students. Now at Cincinnati, he was one of the very few black students on campus. And it was a good thing for Oscar 
Oscar that he wasn't just an athlete with no brain. He had always been a very good student and was prepared to work hard at his studies. He could compete academically with any student on campus at Cincinnati. And that leads us to our next episode in part two of the Oscar Robertson story. So in our next episode, we will cover Oscar's time at Cincinnati and how he became a national basketball superstar. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcast and check out our page on Facebook. It is called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There you will find shorter historical posts as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I will also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care and see you soon. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude, and I wanted to thank you for stopping by to listen to another episode here on the Sports History Network. Our podcasters are passionate about uncovering and sharing sports stories from yesteryear. And if you didn't know it already, we have over 30 shows across the network covering all sorts of sports history topics. In fact, here's a glimpse into one of our awesome podcasts here on the network. Do you wish you knew more about the 100 seasons of the NFL? You're in luck because you found the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. From the founding of the league in an auto showroom, all the way to what it is today, America's favorite sport and a behemoth of an industry. My name is Ernie Chapman. Football is my passion, and I want you to come along with me each week to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board, my DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. How about that? I bet you're super hyped to go listen to that new podcast, right? Well, to learn about this show and all the other podcasts on the network, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Again, that's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Head over there today to find your next favorite sports history podcast.